Um, so this talk is about real-time rat pack. Again, this is this is a talk prepared by my colleague. So yeah, we're going to we're going to do the first half of the talk is kind of we're going to do a general introduction to Rat Pack and kind of build up to showing some interesting real time website behavior using the Rat Pack framework. So the first few few examples are going to be really simple stuff, but the interesting thing is you can kind of see it doesn't take a lot of code to add in this adding the kind of real time facets to, to the example, and we'll just build it up in time. So I'll get started. So Rat Pack itself, just to give you a quick background, is Originally, it started as a Groovy port of Sinatra, so uh, Sinatra's uh, lightweight web framework for Ruby. Um, and then it was taken over by, by Luke Daly, who I think he was intending to, he now actually used it to do the Gradle plugins port for, right? Yeah. And I think that was his intention, that's why he got involved with it in the first place, looking for something to build out with. Um, and he kind of just went crazy with his project and he totally turned it in a completely different direction. So it's no longer Ruby, it's now pure Java, it's, it's way more capable. Sinatra port. It's, it's a really interesting non blocking um, framework, much more than just a kind of web micro framework like Express or, or Sinatra. The name obviously is a play on Sinatra, but um, beyond that, it doesn't really bear much resemblance to it anymore. Um, so there, there's a whole, a whole load of capabilities in there, like server side templating, data binding, security, session management, all of these things. Um, and websites and message driven architecture is one of the a couple of things that um, Rat Pack's a really compelling option for, I think. So, we still have, even though it's moved away from the, the Sinatra Foundation, it's still got the, the, the message here if you want it. So, this is a Rat Pack application that's executing just with a tiny bit of, um, tiny bit of group code. And it's just producing, so it's statically importing this Rat Pack method that takes a closure. And that's kind of the gateway into the, the, the Rat Pack handle the SL and explore a little bit over the next few minutes. Um, so we're defining a single handler there, it's on it's, it's going to be on the default context and it's just going to stick out of the the screen. Um, like I said, Rat Pack, the core API is everything written in Java, it's all 100 percent um, static, strongly typed API, even though it's got first class support for Ruby and a lot of the typical use cases for it. Closures and Ruby and stuff all over the place. One of the really nice things about working with Rat Pack, I find, is that all of your IDE auto completion works. You've got all this hinting coming from your tools because the entire API itself is strongly typed and uses the delegates to annotation all over the place. So you, you know, ID uh, the ID can tell what the target of a what the delegate of a closure is in, in all circumstances. And you can use co, a co completion in some pretty unexpected places, you know. Deep in nested closures and all sorts of places, it actually works really beautifully. Um, so, the core is written in Java 7 right now. I know it's going to migrate to the Java 8 only pretty soon. Um, you can write Rat Pack apps right now using, using Java 7, but it's, it's not anything like as compelling as using Java 8 lambdas or Ruby closures, right? So, you end up writing a lot of order code code and using an awful lot of anonymous image classes and that kind of thing. It's much, much nicer if you and it's kind of designed, that's the sweet spot, that's what it's designed for. Java 7 is going to be dropped soon. Um, the whole framework is going to be Java 8. Um, so it's really, it, you know, the, the emphasis is on performance at start of time, is blinding fast. The uh, Rat Pack itself is based on Netty, it's a completely non blocking request model. Um, and Ruby has come along a long way in the last couple of years and has some features now that make the emphasis is on totally on speed of the Rat Pack, so Netty non blocking is using all the Java 7 non blocking APIs um, on top of Netty. But it just brings a kind of, some kind of organization to it. So Netty is not a web framework. It can be used, it can be made to behave like a web framework, but it's you know, it's a TCP framework, right? So it's pretty low level. And um, Rat Pack brings some really nice organization over the top of that and applies some some sort of concept and patterns to it so that you're not having to reinvent the entire entirety of the web framework on the because it can be chaos, right? If you're 
just trying to write some nice non block web code um, using the raw Nexty libraries. Um, so, startup time is really fast. Typically, milliseconds are often even like two digit milliseconds to start up on that. Um, but another thing is developer productivity, developer speed is really important. So, RackTech is spring loaded so that it can have runtime reloading, even though the startup time is pretty fast. So, it's almost not such an issue as it would be with something like Rails, where the application itself takes a significant amount of time to come up. Um, but, RackTech does have runtime reloading of, of components. Um, and as I said, the, all of the kind of IDE um, features are enabled so that you can, you can work faster with Rat Pack as well. Um, and the key thing is, Rat Pack is 100% your gateway drug to non blocking. So, non blocking code kind of is non trivial to write. If you've ever done anything with Node and you've got into that kind of hole, call back hell of loads of nested, nested anonymous functions or really easy nested closures. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but Rat Pack just applies a, a really nice layer of simplicity over the top of that. So you can kind of get all the benefits of non blocking performance without really having to worry very much about structuring your code in such a way as to be optimally non blocking. So it's kind of it's kind of async and maybe easy. And a really nice comment that Dad made actually is that um, you know our our brains don't think in async. It's really hard to think to reason about asynchronous code. Computers can do it, we can't. So the, the framework kind of reaches that gap and hides that basically from The key concept in Rat Pack is the handler chain. So this is kind of the, the core of everything. This is the thing, the number one thing you need to understand. Um, so in Rat Pack, everything's done with handlers. Um, so handlers can be kind of thought to Grail's controller methods, I guess, in a way, typically, but they can also be used in other ways as well, which I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to jump over and do some demo. I'll show you some demos here now. Um, so Rat Pack, a handler is the point at which Rat Pack hands, hands control of the request and the response to your code. So that's kind of where your code starts interacting with, with um, the HTTP request and response. So let's... Uh, Simple wrap back Ruby script here. Oh, sorry, yeah, I keep getting to do the magic trick that mirrors the screens. If I forget that, you won't remind me. I'm trying to do the talk facing people rather than have to turn around the screen all the time. It's like it's all the neck doing it here sort of. um, So here we've got the, uh, we're importing, statically importing uh, the Ruby wrap pack method again. We're defining some handlers here. We're using so we're defining handlers defines the handler chain. You can have multiple handlers within there. So here we're just defining one, but we're splitting it down using by method. So what that does is it's like it's con content negotiation in the same way that Grails has. I forget the actual construct in Grails, but Grails has the concept that if the incoming request is a get, you can treat it, you can send it off to one method or, or one closure. Um, if it's a post, you can do something different. So here we've got a get handler that's just going to render some HTML with a hello world on it. Um, we've got a post handler, that's just going to print something out. So let's just take a look at what's working, let's see how fast it is to execute. So, no, that's the wrong key combination. There we go. Bang, it's up and running. So let's flip over into Chrome. Hit localhost 5050. And, oh well, there we go, so we've got our HTML there. We've Yes, that's exactly, yeah. 
Yeah, so stripping the margin, I guess. I don't know why Dan's laid it out this way. You only need to do one of them. Since we're using a five, just to just keep the margin. Yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to change his code because it's like, well, set up and get branches and so on. So <laughs> <laughs> if I change something, I'm going to break something. Um, so I just want to grab something on the back here. I've got some notes on when I'm actually doing the. So yeah, I can show you what the IDE support looks like. So here we're like, how many? One, two, three, five, just deep. <coughs> we still got auto working. Um, so it's just really fantastic how, how well that stuff works, and especially for an idiot like me, you can never remember anything. You can remember what any method's called, it's really useful to have that. Um, oh, I'm not reloading as well, so let's change this method here. I'm not going to restart the server, I'm just going to So this is an I, I said earlier that a handler can be thought of in a way like a controller action in, in Rails, but it can also behave like a filter, right? So it's a chain. The handler, the key concept that you need to understand about handlers is that they act as a chain. So Rappack can go down the contents of this handler block and look at each individual thing in there and see if it matches the request. Now this is a general handler that will match any request. And we've got two that both will match any request. And if that if you have that situation, Rappack will value the first one in declaration or the first execute that. So here we're doing like we're just filtering out anyone who's coming in on Chrome and returning a HTTP 418 which is uh, I'm a teapot. <laughs> if they're not on Chrome we're, we're using this next method which is part of the Rat Pack API and that just means okay proceed along to the next handler in the chain. So this handler is acting very much like a server filter would. Um, and the handler below is acting much more like a server or a controller method. So let's go to the second look if it's working. We're not allowed to Okay, um, if I look at the yeah, tools there, it's probably a little small, but you can see yeah, HTTP 418, IMT ports. So let's change that. We probably didn't want to block Chrome now, right? Because we like Chrome. <laughs> Injection is another interesting thing with Rappack. So Rappack by default, it, it, it has an abstraction over the concept of dependency injection. So by default, it uses juice for dependency injection. You don't have to use juice. You can use nothing. You may not need dependency injection if you're using really small microservice. My name is Dave Sire. The tool has produced a proof of concept Spring implementation. So you can actually use uh, the Spring, the Spring um, application container, application context as your framework inside of Rappack. Um, so Rappack has this thing called a registry, which is kind of its abstraction of, over top of whatever um, dependency injection framework you have to be using, and that's what you interact with. Um, the Groovy DSL is, is really interesting here as well, because you can do dependency injection just by declaring a, a parameter to a closure. So we, we looked at those handle closures earlier, and if you can just, if you have a, if you have some kind of bean in your DI context, you can just declare a parameter to that closure and it gets injected for you. So Rappack is doing all that using its registry and it it's just makes dependency injection so super simple. Um, so let's take a look at an example again.
do actually need to restart in this situation. So that's passes. So here we've added a new pander into the chain using this um, using this prefix method. And what the prefix method does is it says, okay, so anything that's coming in on slash API, anything at all, will be handled by nested nested handles within the, within this um, this version. So you can kind of compose together an entire hierarchy using multiple prefixes nested within each other here at one level. So anything coming in on API will go into this handler. So this this handle will match anything with that URL prefix on the path. And if it doesn't match, we are going to drop through to this assets method. So what the assets method does, this is just a way of serving up all your static assets. So it's saying anything under this public directory, I want you to just serve up. So if something comes in and asking for a JavaScript file, for example, let's take a look in the public, we have some CSS, we have some JavaScript. So if we if you ask for like dash uh, slash app.js, it'll match this file here. If we try and map uh, use something that doesn't match anything, it's going to use this index.html file, right? So if you just come from root context or if you put some nonsense in, um, it, it'll use index.html instead. So, so we have an API prefix. We've got a post there which allows us to post a uh, photograph. So we're going to, I'll show you what the app looks like quickly. So we can just, you know, and that's been an Ajax post of that photo data. So if we go back to the Rat Pack code here, we are we are parsing the form using Rat Pack's API there, and then we're pulling from that form a piece of data called the photo. So that's going to be like a byte array, and then we're saving it using this photo service. And then we're responding with the ID, the JSON with the ID that was generated by the photo service. So now, what's this photo service and where did it come from? You can see here, it's been, it's been declared as a parameter of this post handler. Where does that come from? Look up a little bit. Before the handles chain, we've got the bindings block. And there we are using, using some um, RAPPAX registry methods to bind an in-memory photo service. So that's an implementation of this photo service interface. So we're saying anytime somebody asks for a photo service from the registry, give them this singleton in-memory photo service instance. And all we have to do is get that dependency injection to work is declare the parameter on the closure there. That's really, really neat. We can also easily swap out, this is using juice under the hood, we can swap out a different service so we can use like a real persistent version which is actually going to write our photos off to a temporary should just swap in without any, any problems there. And now these files are real persistent files on this. I'm not sure what the folder is, so I'm not going to try and prove that to you, but believe me, that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> slash API slash 
whatever the ID is. So then it's going to go look for that photo using that ID and it's going to respond with you know, a content type of image PNG and the photo byte string. Now one of the interesting things you might see here is this blocking thing. So I mentioned earlier that Rat Pack is a 100% non-blocking API, but obviously <coughs> in this case we are doing some blocking code because we're reading stuff off the disk, right? So we don't want to be blocking the request for anything. And Rat Pack makes it super easy to just say, okay, this is some blocking code, separate it out, run it on a different thread, off the request thread, and when it's done, it um, invokes this then block. So this is like a promise, effectively fulfilling a promise. So whatever is returned from this blocking closure will get passed as a parameter to the, to the then closure. So here we're returning, and because it's strongly typed, we have a byte array coming back from this function method. Uh, IntelliJ knows that that photo object in that other closure is a byte array, so we don't have to we don't have to put the type on it, which is really neat. So type inference is doing all of that for us because it understands. Again, this is all 100% static Java API here, even though it's interacting with previous closures. The underlying method is all done in Java, so you get really good type inference. Um, so this is like Ratpack's way of allowing you to do things off the request thread so that you're not blocking the request thread when you are having to do database I.O. or file I.O. or network I.O. or any of those kind of typical things that would be, would be blocking stories. So this is all good, but it's not real-time web, right? This is just straight up, um, this is just straight up regular web apps. So let's look at um, some real-time web stuff. Oh yeah, there's one thing I want to mention before we get into the real time at the end. Um, so the registry is Ratpack's DI abstraction. It can also be used in tests. So Ratpack has a really nice thing called the remote, remote control um, service. So this is the same stuff in the rat pack of Ruby, but we've also added a line to the bindings block here. So we're adding a remote control module. Now this is a juice module. Um, which, but it's a juice module defined by, by rat pack. So I think we're looking to build up right over here in 14. Yeah, rat pack's remote test library. So if we now go look in our um, our functional test, the functional spec down here. So this is a using some uh, Rat Pack testing APIs here. We have this class called the local script on application under test. So what this is doing is it's going and looking for that Rat Pack Groovy in the expected location. You can override that if you need to, um, and it's going to execute that and provide us with this object, which is like a handle on that running application. We can pass, pass some config to it like this, so that's just saying the remote control is disabled by default for obvious reasons. Like you wouldn't want to go live with that thing running, right? Um, you'll see why in a second. Um, and also, Rat Pack also provides a test HTTP, HTTP client, which we're going to use as a delegate of our um, application here. And then we've got our remote control object, which allows us to interact with the running application. So, in the setup method here, in the setup block here, we are saying, right, we need the ID of this photo, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to get, get the bytes of the photo from the service by its ID. So we, A, we need to know what that ID is, and we need to have the photo saved in the service. Now we can do this by like doing an Ajax upload in the spec. That's kind of going the long way around when what we're testing is nothing to do with the upload process. So Rat Pack allows us to kind of reach under the covers here, use this remote control to execute a closure on the running application. This closure is, is serialized. I think I believe the way I understand it to work is it actually takes that source code of that closure, serializes it, and sends it over over um, a web socket or something to the application, deserializes it, and executes it there. And the really nice thing is we've got access to um, Rat Pack's 
DI extraction here with this dependency injection registry. So, and we've got full type inference and code completion within this uh, remote control closure. So we can say we can get that photo service from the Rat Pack registry. Remember, this closure is executing in the application. We can save some some data, and then it will return the ID back to the test across the wire. Right. So anything coming back from returned by this closure, you will get an exception if it's not serializable. So if it's something like a string, which is typically, you know, this is a pretty typical use case here, it's returning an ID of something the same. Um, if you try and return a more complex object, you will get an exception. But if it's serializable, it should be able to work. And then we can use that ID to do a get request using RatPack's test HTTP client there. So this get is on the test HTTP client object API-ID. And we expect that we get the HTTP 200 status code and we get the same bytes back that we just saved there. Great, so this is, let's just prove it works. Rat pack started, it ran the test, Rat pack stopped again. It's really fast, it's really neat, this is the remote control thing. When I first saw it, I was like, man, maybe that's such a hack, but it's, it's fantastic. It's, it, it's, really, it's a really neat method. So now, yeah, so we've, we've, the stuff we've seen so far is it's just regular, non-real-time uh, <coughs> non web stuff. Um, so let's look at some WebSocket support. So, so WebSocket binding is just another type of handler to wrap back, and it, it provides us with this WebSocket method here, which kind of, we can attach it inside the handler. So actually, this code is actually in the example, so I'm just going to show you the deck. It's kind of easier to do that. Too bad right back running, right? On the tab. Is yeah. it on? Oh, that's what's going on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's try it again now. I should probably just shut it down and show you the previous example. There we go. Thanks. Um, so now if I go back to Chrome and go to this WebSocket HTML page, we can see we're starting to get that's establishing the WebSocket using JavaScript and it's getting dates streamed out to it. Um, Uh, 
Uh, there's, a, there's a little app called Divi that just lets you assign a portion of the screen to the other screen. So we can type on the like this. And you can have people jump across the screen. Does it make it? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is, this is in the binding spot here, so this is a juice beam that gets injected into our closure in the website um, endpoint here. And then we can start broadcasting messages, or this, this, anything connected to this website will start re receiving messages from this broadcaster. And we've got another endpoint we've created here that's just going to send us a message. So let's take a look at this in action. Now I'm sending messages, let me make these a bit bigger. And these are getting piped out to any browser that's connected, so we can have as many windows as we like here, and it's, it's like broadcasting out to all of those different web sockets. So this is like real, this is proper real time web. This is not a dumb example like the previous one. Let's look at an even more compelling example. So going back to our photo app. that mechanism to when we upload a photo using that same post closure we saw before we're also injecting the event broadcaster into that same closure from juice so we're parsing the form as before we're pulling the photo byte stream out of it saving that data generating an id and then we're broadcasting that id to anyone who happens to be listening so let's go back to our windows here Now this, what we can do is broadcast from this window to the other ones. So now we have load photo there and it gets sent around everywhere to anything that's listening. So, and you can see like it was not very much code to make that work.
as if one is one's a myth. Broadcast like that. I mean, what is the approximate overhead? Like, I mean, yes, it's dead simple, right? But if you have like a hundred thousand clients, I mean, what is sort of the overhead associated with that? Well, I mean, you probably would, would want to do it a better way than having like a list of those listeners. That's probably. I'm, I'm going to get to example an example using Apache Camel a little later. Okay. Um, so then you know, it's it's using those libraries in a pretty straightforward way, right? Rapack is really just doing nothing more than a convenient API to access those things. So it, it's going to come down to what is the performance of the of whatever you're using to implement that kind of event broadcasting. So that's a really dumb example to show you how simple it is, but it, it, it's not really a whole lot more complicated when we get to a more advanced example in a minute. Um, so there we didn't have any kind of context um, going on. I want to show you an example now where we, we can kind of broadcast things on different on different contexts. So the HTML is not real, real great with this example. We can blame Dan for that. We can blame him for anything. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm messaging you in real time telling you what you did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so here we've. Um, it's, nice. it's, nice. it's because the UI is not very good. <laughs> yeah, it's like solid platform. No, it's a subliminal <laughs> recruitment message for Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a Mac that you can download. It's a sponsor. So we've added something to the upload here, so we've got a, as well as the photo data, we've got a context string. So let's go look at the page here, we'll make this look bigger. So now we've just got a simple drop down there, it's like we have the full context and like photos about cats and dogs and screenshots. Let's refresh these other ones here. They have the same exact context going on. So if I'm on that full context, I can if I add a photo, everyone gets it. Let's switch this window onto the dog's context. So if I open up another window, oh. only the one on the full context gets it right. So you can, you know, you can use filtered broadcasting in that way. Um, the changes we have to do to do that, if we go look in the event broadcaster, it's just like holding a, a map of lists of, of callback of listeners there instead of just a simple list. So it's just filtering things by this key, which is the channel name. Again, you'd want to do it in a more realistic way, but, but um, it's not really a whole lot more complicated from a rat pack perspective. So then on our WebSocket, we've added a path token to the WebSocket um, handler, so it can specify what channel it wants to listen to effectively. And that's just the one that, you know, in this example, is the one that you're sending when you upload the five things in that form. So that's pretty straightforward. So, when we talk about real-time web, we're talking typically more about more than a single application these days. We're talking about microservice architectures and how do you coordinate the various components of a microservice architecture. Uh, you need something like system-wide events right here, which is pushing some events out from one app to the, to the browser, but we, we need to be thinking about system-wide events that can be used between various service-wide components as well. So, let's look to the final example of a demo of that. So here we can use Apache Camel to build like a simple messaging module um, in Rat Pack. And we're going to use that to kind of do, bring that example together using a slightly more realistic technology stack. So API call, so remember this is when we're posting to upload a photo, we've included this, we've injected this Apache Camel context, and this is coming from a, we've created a messaging module, I'm going to show you some details of that in a minute, and we're initializing that in the, in the binding spot there. We're then injecting that Camel context into the, into the post. 
post by GS, so this is when we're uploading that photo. And then instead of just calling our um, photo service directly to, to assist that photo, we're now just going to send the bytes off across a queue. Now something else is going to listen to that, so when we, if we go look into this messaging mo module, it's registering some handlers, a photo message handler. It's going to listen on that queue. And that just declares, so it extends its message handler, which is fine to the URL, it's going to listen on. And that is going to be the saving of the of photo to the photo service, which again, this can just be injected using, so we can produce and inject an annotation on this, on this piece. And so on this constructor here, so again, this will inject stuff into this constructor using Rat Pack's um, register, DI register. So now, instead of directly saving this and kind of causing a blocking operation here, and having to use that blocking construct that I showed you earlier, we're just going to put those image bytes into a queue and let something else handle the persistence. And we can also have another thing that's listening to that, um, that same Same exact thing, but now it's kind of doing this in a much more efficient and realistic way. But we didn't really have to add a whole lot more code to um, we didn't really have to have a, have a whole lot more code to our app application to do that. We just leveraging the library that um, leveraging that camel library. So yeah, we haven't added a whole lot more. Systems are completely decoupled from the request that's uploading the data. Um, I should jump back to summarize. So, to sum up, Rat Pack is a high speed web application framework. Um, it supports a lot of this real, real time stuff. Fairly simply, it's not just about web sockets, we've seen some more simple messaging examples there. Um, again, there's this interesting concept that Rat Pack is an unopinionated framework. It doesn't impose its way of doing things on you. you can, it will allow you to wire things up in your own way. Um, so it's, it's very simplistic, it tries to get out of the way, it makes it simple for you to use some defaults, but if you don't want to use those defaults, it just gets the hell out of the way so you can do whatever you like. Um, and yeah, it's, you've seen that in the example there of how simple it is in terms of volume of code to add some really pretty sophisticated real-time um, behavior to a simple web app. So, um, if there are any questions, far away now, I have rat pack stickers to give away here. Does anyone like one? I guess that's the Is there any size limitation when you're sending stuff across like that? It's, again, it's going to depend on what you're using under the hood, right? So if rat pack's not imposing anything there, it's just providing access to those those things. So, so if, if there's an invitation in the patch of town, like, there may or may not be on the resource, but um, yeah, the limitation is going to be outside of the control of Rat Pack, so that's going to depend on the kind of you're using. There's also some uh, limitations in Netty about the full size of like HTTP request block. Yes. But they're ridiculously large and you can it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, so you can probably upload some pretty big images. You can do a multi-part and it'll be fine. Well, how about you try to show me to do a single part? Do you have any opinions about what kind of application you would use this for versus something like Vertex? They seem like they're fairly similar. Yeah, I mean, I mean Vertex 
obviously interesting, and I've had a bit of a play with it, but I found it, it, its model a little awkward. So it has this concept of verticals, which are completely class over isolated. And I think they're slightly moving away from this now, but you don't have to do that. Because like, if you want to share a library between multiple verticals, it's kind of, you have to have copies of it on separate class parts. It's a little bit, if that's what you want, if you need that kind of isolation, great. If you don't, it's, it's a bit of a pain, I found. And I think Rat Pack is just a slightly simpler model. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's for a similar story. I think Vertex is going to be great for what the guys were talking about yesterday. There's lots of real time stuff and kind of embedded things and where you need to really get down to the raw performance. But it's actually interesting that I know Luke's done some measurement and Rat Pack is not a whole lot slower than, than Vertex. It's, it is a tiny bit slower because it is doing a little bit more there, but um, it, is, it is pretty damn fast. So it would, be, it would be really interesting to see the figures, uh, the guys um, from the, 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 the Vertex tool yesterday, where they had those graphs of Vertex against uh, Node.js, it would be like really interesting to try and develop something equivalent for Rat Pack and see, you know, I think that the variation there would be very, very similar. Yeah. So, especially when using Java. Yeah. Is there a, a demo somewhere where, let's say you've got a huge JSON payload, you're so going through each record that you have a paper and uh, stream, let's say, uh, a picture, um, which is being some those JSON elements mm -hmm. live uh, as you pass the, the JSON. Well, any example like that yeah. where you uh, doing something, like something and right away uh, stream uh, some results. Yeah, that would be a nice thing to I haven't seen a demo like that. would be a nice thing to do. Yeah. Because that's pretty yeah. really also real time. Yeah, yeah. A way to decrease the latency <coughs> right away, etc. Yeah, that would be an awesome thing to do. Okay, yeah. Is there any particular support for any kind of security module? There is a security module, actually. Mm -hmm. Jeff is probably a better person to ask it. I'm going to for Jeff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pack for Jeff. It's an abstraction over quite a few other ones. Uh, it does good a lot and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it can do token auth and basic and things like that. Okay. It seems to do everything in the kitchen sink. I know it's out there. I have not learned it. <laughs> yeah, I've done, I've done very, very simple things with it. And it's, it's pretty straightforward, but I don't know much about it. So is it like a plugin model then? Or is it it's kind of, well, Rat Pack is, um, it doesn't have its own plugin conventions, right? It's just, everything's just jars. Right. So it's very, very simple to just okay. use. Even if it's a, a, a kind of juice module designed to use Rat Pack, it's just going to be shipped to Java, right? So everything's, everything's binary, everything's real simple. There's no runtime magic going on at all, um, or build time magic, like, like you have for Rails. So, yeah, it's, it's a much simpler model. If you were to run this somewhere, like right now you're doing it for local, but if you wanted to package it in place, there's something. Yeah, it's just, um, so Rat Pack typically uses Gradle, and you just 